Good afternoon. Herzlich willkommen uh, to the ASO Media Masterclass uh, at our European Congress on Obesity 2018. Um, my name is Sven. I am an active EASO Patient Council member and I also work with uh, the European Medicines Agency as a patient representative. I live in Ireland. I'm a software engineer and uh, I'm also a patient advocate and I'm passionate about uh, tackling obesity stigma and uh, making access to obesity treatment more commonly available and uh, affordable. Today, this afternoon, uh, together with me, we have, um, on her way from the airport, uh, coming in hopefully soon, Jimena Ram uh, Salas. Uh, Jimena is a PhD in Health Promotion and Social Behavioral Sciences from the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta, Edmont Edmonton, Canada. She's a managing director of the Canadian Obesity Network and a techni technical consultant with the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. Uh, she's going to talk to us, and I think Sherry is going uh, to take over uh, about uh, does the public health narrative of obesity influence media coverage? Um, in her presentation, Hamina will, or Sherry in this case, will explore how public health and media narratives of obesity may have unintended consequences for individuals living with obesity. Her goal is to spark solutions that will prevent the perpetuation of weight bias and obesity stigma and create more effective population health approaches. Uh, next, I think it's going to be Ted, Ted Kyle. Um, Ted is a RPH and MBA. Uh, Ted founded Conscient Health in 2009, where he advises organizations and writes daily on issues related to health and obesity. He serves on Obesity Action Coalition Board of Directors and he has also served as its chair. Ted will tell us about uh, informing the public and breaking through scientific misinformation about obesity and the role of media. Uh, in its talk, he will uh, touch on myths, presumptions, and facts about obesity who often become confused in public perceptions. We will look at uh, common examples of each and uh, offer strategies for media to inform and empower the public with good information. And uh, following Ted will be uh, Joe Naklowski. Joe is president and CEO of the Obesity Action Coalition, uh, a US-based patient advocacy organization for those affected by obesity. He has led OAC since its founding in 2005 and uh, has more than 25 years of patient advocacy experience. Te uh, Joe sorry, will talk uh, about the impact of the media on people with obesity. The media and its messaging profoundly affects people living with obesity. This presentation delivered by Joe um, will feature real world examples and experiences of how media messages affect the care and lives of the 60,000 members of the OIC in the United States and the millions of people living with obesity. Without further ado, uh, Shiri. Thank you. So I am not Jimena and I haven't actually these aren't my slides, but um, it's Jimena has done great work on uh, looking at media and sort of the health narrative of obesity. So weight bias and discrimination, we all know. Rampant in schools, the workplace, in the health system, and in media. Weight bias refers to negative attitudes about others because of their weight. Weight stigma is stereotypes and labels we assign to people who have obesity. And discrimination refers to actions against people with obesity that can cause inequalities and social exclusion. So what are these public health obesity narratives? Public health messages are very simplistic and don't represent reality. They put the blame on people with obesity. The quantification of health in terms of BMI and weight is unrealistic. So weight bias, a huge challenge to implementing comprehensive obesity related chronic disease prevention and management is this shaming perspective. Individuals with obesity perceive current individual focused obesity prevention and management initiatives as simplistic and disempowering 
and very stigmatizing. I love this chart. So here's the, the way it looks, um, the weight bias experience. And you, know, you can talk to some of our patient council members who are here after the session about this, um, this experience. So there's a lack of understanding of obesity and experiences of weight bias and stigma, which are taken to heart. They have an impact on the self. That results in an emotional response and then a behavioral response. And in the recovery process, there's this resistance. And I think our advocates are on that journey now. So changing the narrative within the media. Um, weight bias and weight-based discrimination is associated with all sorts of costs, both economic and, and human, to people living with obesity. And it's a huge determinant of health and, you know, and life chances. And we've heard in the Congress about the impact on employment opportunities as well as health, um, health in present and in the future. And changing the narrative so that, that obesity can be prevented by healthy eating and exercising is, um, is challenging because people look for easy solutions. So we have to avoid the temptation to simplify and you know, look at obesity as an individual behavioral issue and look at the complexity, truly the complexity of obesity. So the key message is obesity is a complex chronic disease that's the result of a huge interaction of genetic, metabolic, behavioral, and environmental factors. There's no one cause and there's no one solution. So cutting sugar from your diet is not gonna do it. There are effective behavioral treatment, surgical options, medications that people living with obesity need improved access to in order to improve their quality of life and their health. Thank you. From the Obesity Action. Thanks, Sheree. Uh, Ted, please. Thank you so much, Cherie. Uh, I'm going to build on some of the themes that you talked about. Uh, Jimena, I know it's killing her that she's trapped on a plane at the airport with this thunderstorm. They won't let her off. It's like being in a tin can. But uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the role of the media in informing the public and breaking through some of the scientific misinformation that propagates uh, in uh, consumer information about obesity, and it really affects, uh, I know Joe is going to talk about how it affects people living with obesity. It affects policymakers as well. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, work that I've done for various people, and also personal biases that I have about evidence-based interventions for both prevention and treatment, respect for people living with obesity, and critical thinking about all of the evidence that's out there. It is so tempting when the subject is obesity to zero in on what we wish were true or what we know in our heart is true, but we don't actually have evidence. And that, uh, that causes problems. So I'm going to provide some perspective on obesity, uh, really thinking about critical thinking and, and objective reporting. Describe the role that bias has to play in this. Uh, I know Joe is going to talk about bias because that's something very important to the OAC. Uh, I'm going to come at it from a little slightly different angle, but uh, from my perspective, you can't get too much of that. And I'm going to talk about some opportunities for the media to better inform the public. So uh, for background, I would just say that, that research has shown us that uh, there are competing narratives out there uh, that uh, have a big effect on the public perceptions about obesity. Traditionally in the US, and uh, based on some research that we presented here at the meeting yesterday, uh, a dominant theme uh, looking backward has been the narrative of moral failure. The idea that uh, obesity is the product of some kind of disgusting failure of personal responsibility. It's a false narrative, but it's one that occupies the public imagination. Then something that, that we found really all over the world is uh, the idea of 
Obesity is the product of addiction. People become hooked on junk food and sugary drinks. Uh, there's a lot of currency for that. Uh, uh, probably it's uh, on its way to being a dominant narrative, even though scientists are kind of debating the applicability of addiction to, to food. There's something there, but there's something that's not quite there. It's maybe an element of what's going on, but uh, despite what you may have read in the papers, uh, sugar is not the new cocaine. Uh, then an another idea which, uh, which has a great deal of truth to it is a toxic environment filled with too much unhealthy food, making exercise impossible. And then finally, there's the medical narrative that says uh, obesity has become such a problem because we're putting so much energy into blaming uh, rather than helping people with this condition. Uh, I just want to acquaint you with the idea that, that, that rocket science is complicated. What does complicated mean? Complicated means that, uh, that there are linear relationships where one thing leads to another and you can sort it out and you can find a root cause. Uh, unfortunately, obesity is not as simple as rocket science. <laughs> this is a uh, systems map that uh, folks in the UK developed looking at all of the various systems that interact in obesity and uh, and these are systems, complex adaptive systems from which obesity grows. They interact with each other. There's social psychology, there's individual psychology, there's the individual's physical activity. You know, I go and work out at the gym so I'm virtuous and I'm exercising. But then you've got the physical activity environment where after that half an hour that I spend in the day, uh, I'm working in an environment where I'm sitting in front of a screen all day uh, and uh, moving around in a community where walking is impossible. And so actually, I'm pretty inactive for most of the day just because of that physical activity environment. There's individual physiology, uh, and then there's the broader category of human physiology. There's uh, food consumption that we all engage in, and then there's food production and marketing that interfaces with our individual choices about food consumption. All of these come together so that if you push on one part of the system, it pushes back somewhere else. It adapts. Uh, we start recommending, for example, in the 1980s, a low-fat diet makes sense. Fat is uh, one of the most calorie-dense macronutrients that you can eat. And uh, so everybody says, yeah, that, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that. And uh, we will cut fat out of the food supply or, or, or emphasize non-fat sources of nourishment. And, uh, and things spring up like low-fat candy and low-fat cookies and uh, all kinds of things that are healthy. We're still drinking uh, largely low-fat uh, dairy products, and now people are arguing about what a, whether or not that was a good idea. But the systems interact, and you push in one place, they push back in another, and uh, it's not so simple as rocket science, because in rocket science, you've got an engine, you light it, and you go, uh, and you just got to get the physics right. <laughs> so uh, that kind of leads me to the thought that pervasive bias hampers clinical care and obesity-related policy. It involves really two different kinds of, uh, of bias. This speaks to the bias toward people with obesity, blaming people who are living with obesity. It sets up a counterproductive tension between prevention and clinical care, uh, where uh, people living with obesity are kind of discarded in the thinking. and. Uh, there's, there's an unspoken, well, it's unfortunate, but we have to prevent obesity in the next generation. Unfortunately, obesity is transmitted from generation to generation, so you really can't discard uh, or separate prevention from treatment. And it leads to a dysfunctional medical dialogue where uh, Evan, um, my brain's failing me, the OMA, Ethan? Ethan Lazarus <laughs> says that as a GP in the U.S., his training on obesity, 
his formal training on obesity was limited to instruct the patient to lose weight. Boom. Why didn't I think of that? Uh, so uh, uh, our, my good friend Sarah Kirk said, uh, basically summed up the, the experience that patients have when they interact with that, saying that uh, it's pretty clear that the, we have a health system that is un, totally unsupportive of people who are living with obesity. Uh, so the other kind of bias is an intellectual bias that favors personal convictions. Uh, and, and that bias starts with research and scientific literature. There are a lot of observational studies, a lot of short-term endpoints, a lot of surrogate endpoints, a lot of publication bias that takes associations of, uh, uh, of various nutrients and says, well, there's an association here, so there must be a cause and effect relationship. And uh, by that kind of of, uh, of bias being uh, perpetuated, a lot of conjectures uh, get advanced in to recommendations to reduce weight gain or promote weight loss through things that sound great. Eat breakfast every day. Eat more fruits and vegetables. Eat more meals with your family me members. Let's cut, on, cut down on fast food availability. Eliminate vending machines from school. All of these are perfectly reasonable things to, to give a try to. Uh, but then it's kind of tough to go back when you've committed yourself to doing all these things to say, well, is it really making a difference? And sometimes you find out along the way that it's, it's really not. Right now in the United States, we're implementing menu labeling, and uh, the uh, di public dialogue around menu labeling is shifting from, we're doing all this menu labeling, and it's probably going to have zero impact on uh, obesity prevalence, but it's still a good thing anyway it fosters a little bit of skepticism in the public. M moving on to elements of bias against people with obesity, uh, you have blame, you have assumptions of laziness, you have social rejection where there's a discomfort in actually interacting on a, on a social level with people with, with obesity. And that, that bias flows from common assumptions. <coughs> people think that they can look at a person and decide uh, what are their health-related habits, but it turns out that uh, appearances can be quite deceiving. You don't really know what a person's behaviors are uh, based upon looking at them. Uh, you, uh, you cannot, as they say, judge a book by its cover. Health professionals, unfortunately, harbor this bias against patients with obesity, uh, and this has been documented across many different health professions. Uh, thinking of them as non-compliant, lazy, lacking in self-control, awkward, weak-willed, sloppy, unsuccessful, unintelligent, dishonest. One of my favorite uh, sort of anecdotes about this comes from an obesity medicine physician in Washington, D.C., who's also a member of the board of the Obesity Action Coalition, and he talks about receiving a referral of a patient with obesity from a, from a very good and caring primary care physician who says to him on the phone, I'd like you to see Mary, who you know, really has, is coping, trying to cope with very severe obesity, but she's really a good person, as if that's an exception. And, and this is not a doctor who explicitly has harsh feelings about this person, but he feels like he has to explain that despite that severe obesity that she did not choose. Uh, that, uh, that she's a good person nonetheless. What happens when you encounter bias like that is that patients start uh, avoiding care. They delay appointments. It's an unpleasant experience. I remember being upset with my physician. I've been taking anti-obesity medications for 15 years now. And uh, he told the pharmacy that I didn't need them, which meant that I wasn't... You know, wouldn't receive any reimbursement from my insurance carrier, and so I went to see him, and, and he told me some things about that medication that were false, and it just, you know, it, even though I knew I knew more about it than he did, I sat there thinking, uh, why do I have to deal with this? 
<laughs> and uh, he said, well, that's not indicated to maintain weight loss. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, you should probably read the package insert because they did double-blind placebo-controlled studies to show that if you've lost weight with this medication, you will regain it when you stop taking it, just like your blood pressure will go up when you start stop taking antihypertensive medications. So they avoid routine preventive care. Uh, there have been studies that show that, that, that folks who encounter bias from a primary care physician start seeking care in emergency departments and start shopping for doctors, which gets in the way of building a trusting relationship with a primary care provider, which is an optimal way to maximize health. Bias compromises the quality of care because you get less empathetic care, you get less preventive care, patients feel berated and disrespected, and obesity is blamed for every symptom. Uh, a quote that I thought was fairly compelling was that you could walk in with an ax sticking out of your head, and uh, many physicians will tell you that your head hurts because you're fat. And this is an experience that you hear from patients and patient advocates over and over again, doctors have a hard time seeing past a person who's carrying an, a lot of extra weight, and it's a really humiliating experience over and over again every time you see a healthcare professional for them to uh, tell you that, that they've had a revelation that you are, uh, you are heavy. That had occurred to you already. So I'm going to move on to those biases about people to uh, some biases, some myths about, about uh, obesity. Starting with uh, the idea that uh, obesity is primarily the result of, of bad choices. Another example of a myth that gets, that gets repeated frequently is that promoting breastfeeding will actually prevent obesity. Uh, as a, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. Preventing bre promoting breastfeeding is a really, really, really good thing. Don't, don't get me wrong about that, but uh, uh, obesity has been used as a reason to promote it, and uh, the, scientific, uh, the scientific literature really says that uh, the effect of breastfeeding on obesity prevalence is close to negligible. It promotes health in many, many other ways. It's just not going to prevent us, uh, prevent us out of, uh, of uh, an excess of obesity. Uh, another another uh, aphorism that, that gets that's out there it gets repeated over and over again is that skipping breakfast causes weight gain and that's been studied in a controlled uh, in a in a randomized controlled uh, setting and and what it comes down to is if you want breakfast have breakfast if you don't want breakfast don't force yourself to eat breakfast because actually that's probably not going to help you control your weight it might push you in the other direction if you feel like you have to eat first thing in the morning and you don't really feel like it. But back to this thing of choices, which is primary. And, and it, it's a thing that I have a tough time with on uh, when the public interfaces with the stuff that I read. And that is, you know, this question of whether obesity is primarily the result of bad choices. I think it's fair to say that obesity is, uh, is the result of the interaction of environment with genes and personal choices. Roughly, uh, you know, and this is a rough approximation, what would you say, uh, what, what percentage goes with the, each of those factors? Anybody? A quiz here? Come on. Audience participation? <laughs> I won't shame you if you get the wrong answer. I'll say that's a good thought. <laughs> come on, come on, come on, come on. Anybody? What's 70%? Genes! We have a winner! <laughs> Environment is 20% and uh, individual choices uh, can move your weight maybe about 10% before the physiology takes over and, uh, and, and does it. Uh, now, when you put that information out there, the heritability of obesity has been studied extensively and, uh, and pegged at about 70%. And people say, well, how can that be? Our genes have not changed that fast. Why do we have so much more obesity. And the fact is that, that susceptibility, just like any uh, genetically influenced condition, merely sets the table. The environment serves the meal and, uh, and determines whether or not that's going to be triggered. What we have now is an environment that, 
that triggers more obesity in susceptible individuals. But there are individuals out there who, no matter the changes in the environment, they are resistant. They're resistant because they're wired to be resistant to obesity. And those are the people who are going to starve the next time we have a famine. So you can kiss them goodbye. Uh, it's well understood, really going back decades, uh, as a highly heritable disease based on twin studies and based on other, other research. Another excuse people give for rejecting this idea is, don't tell me this is genetic. There, is, you know, there are single gene mutations that give you obesity, but those are extremely rare. Yes, that's absolutely true. But the thing is that the susceptibility to obesity is determined by multiple genes most often. It's not determined by a single genetic mutation. So the environment interacts with genes to yield obesity. Uh, people think a lot about the, uh, you know, the, 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 Noxious foods like fat burger that uh, uh, that uh, engender obesity, uh, but uh, a recent uh, uh, commentary in obesity by uh, Kevin Hall is probably worth reading when it talks about how has the food supply caused obesity, and uh, he says that it might not be all about macronutrients, you know, the evil sugar or the evil fat or. What not? It might be about the total of the way the food environment is is now shaped to put food at your fingertips everywhere you turn. But in any event, it's that environment that pushes more and more opportunities to eat at us. Uh, Mary Foran said to me yesterday, it was kind of striking. She said, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't think that I would perish if I had to go through the afternoon without a snack. Uh, but today, you know, we expect something. There's a nice uh, table of food back there in the back. We expect it. Uh, so beyond those myths that we talked about, here are some presumptions. Uh, and right now, it's very popular to think that taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages and junk food will prevent the progression, uh, the prevalence of, uh, of obesity from growing. And that's a perfectly reasonable presumption. Uh, but uh, if you read the literature quite carefully, you'll find out that, in fact, it is a presumption. These taxes have resulted in a decline in the consumption of sugar. I think I heard uh, Dame Sally Davies say this morning that they've had a 45% reduction in sugar consumption in the UK as a result of the uh, fairly aggressive uh, taxing regimen. Uh, but uh, these complex adaptive systems that feed us have a way of figuring out other ways to, uh, to keep us well-fed and happy and, and, uh, and make money on our uh, desires for nourishment. Uh, then there's some uh, debate about low-fat dairy. It's still in the U.S. dietary guidelines, uh, and uh, there's, there's a lot of debate. You've probably read some things by Nina Teicholz, uh, who is... Uh, uh, quite a quite a, uh, a, a troublemaker uh, talking about uh, the the dumb idea of promoting low fat dairy. That in fact uh, there are reasons to believe that low fat dairy might not be uh, a, a really good thing. Uh, but you know it's 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 a reasonable presumption. We're continuing to go with that presumption. Uh, people are going to test it. Uh, and then there's the idea that promoting fruits and vegetables will reduce obesity. Sounds like a good thing, makes sense. Your mother told you to eat your vegetables, and uh, we think we should. Uh, unfortunately, we're not real good at p getting people to eat vegetables. So if we got people to really nosh all day long on vegetables, it's just possible that those lovely, uh, uh, that, that, all that stuff that we started eating would, would have an effect. And there are actually some studies that say, you know, if you could actually succeed in having people max out on fruit and vegetable, you, you might not be reducing the prevalence of obesity. You would certainly enhance the health of, of people, and that's not a, not a bad thing. So myths, presumptions, here are a few facts. Inheritance is not destiny, and this is important for human beings to understand. It's like any other chronic condition, yes, uh, the best thing you can do is choose your parents carefully. Uh, but uh, <laughs> since that ship has already sailed, 
you, you might have gotten the, the uh, short straw and uh, been one of the persons that was uh, born with uh, susceptibility to obesity. And then just like if you have a susceptibility to breast cancer or diabetes or, or whatever chronic condition, you have to make a personal decision. Okay, so this really stinks. What am I going to do about it? Uh, and there are things that you can do. Uh, another fact that I think is pretty reliable is that healthy dietary patterns matter more than individual foods. Humans like to say, you know, this is a bad food, don't eat it. But it's in truth, it's the whole pattern of what you eat that has an, uh, a large influence of, of, uh, upon your health. And then another one, that uh, I, I see in some survey work that I've done, uh, the public is getting a better handle on, and that is that you can't outrun a bad diet. Exercise, in the popular imagination, used to be thought of as a great way to shed pounds, you know, just sweat the pounds away. In fact, the scientific literature would say that doesn't work out too well. Uh, and people are starting to realize that, that uh, the quality of your diet uh, can do more to help you control your weight than... Than, uh, than exercise can. Now, of course, you know, one of the reasons why some of these uh, uh, myths like, you know, uh, sweating away the, the, uh, uh, the weight is uh, persistent is because there are other health benefits of, of, of vigorous exercise. People describe exercise as one of the best drugs that you can take, and that's absolutely true, but not, it's just not an effective uh, intervention for weight loss. It's, it, uh, is probably real good for weight maintenance, and it's probably even better for health promotion more broadly. So what, what have I said here? Obesity is complex. It's counterintuitive. Bias hampers our critical thinking about obesity. And, but critical thinking can help us distinguish between myths, presumptions, and facts. What are the opportunities for the media? Well, the media has a huge opportunity to better inform the public, tell the story of real people living with obesity without promoting bias and stigma, employ critical thinking in reporting, and distinguish carefully, and there are experts at your disposal to help you do this, between myths, presumptions, and facts. Um, you can find my presentation at this, uh, at this link, maybe about 30 minutes after this, because I haven't uploaded it yet, but it will be there, I promise. And uh, you can find more information here, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. Uh, at least now I know that uh, even though I wanted to be a rocket engineer, I'm actually even better than that. <laughs> and uh, I'm handing over to Joe. Joe, please. Thanks, Van. I appreciate it and very much appreciate uh, EASO uh, inviting me to participate in this master class. I've uh, enjoyed uh, the meeting so far and uh, I'm glad to give my third presentation now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, from OAC's perspective, about the uh, impact of the media on people with obesity. Uh, here are my disclosures. I'm, uh, I don't have any personal disclosures, but OAC does accept funding from a wide variety of industry partners, mostly fo focused on the evidence-based care of obesity. No part of my talk today is product related. Just about our organization, because it that does give me biases, and I'll tell you what those are, is that we are a charity made up of people who live with obesity. So we have 60,000 members in the US, um, and we advocate for them. And we were created after actually one of our elected officials stood up at a meeting on obesity and said, I'm asked every single day to do something about obesity, but never by someone who actually lives with obesity. And so we take that role of being the voice of people with obesity very seriously with our elected officials, but also with the media and the public as well. So these are our core values, and these really are my biases. This is where I come from, from this, uh, this view. So um, people with obesity should be treated with the same level of compassion, dignity, and respect as those with other serious medical conditions. When ready to address their obesity, individuals should have access to insurance coverage of evidence-based medical treatments without undue limitations on access or excessive co-pays. And then finally, that no one should be stigmatized and or discriminated against because of their weight, their failure to seek treatment, or their choosing to seek treatment, because people who seek treatment also uh, face bias as well. 
So when we talk about the impact of the media, and I'm going to pick on our media members for a few minutes, and I actually recognize that most of the articles I read, actually, I'm okay with the content of the article, which I know is what most of you who are in here who work on that write. I'm not real happy with your copy editor who picked the headline or your photo editor who picked the image. Um, and these salacious headlines are every day, at least in the US media. Um, and I'm gonna be frank, I mean, these have a real impact on people. You know, someone is not going to try to get help if they think their story is going to be told in the media that you needed to use a crane or a forklift to move them out. These kind of messages really impact people who live this day. The real story about this should be here. These headlines should be about the county or the city they live in not having the appropriate equipment to care for, for these folks, not that we had to use a forklift or a crane to move in. That would have been the real role, I think, of, of the media story here. Other headlines, and I just picked these couple here, and I'll go in other categories in a second, but another one that stood out to me completely the opposite direction, uh, and actually Ted wrote about this on his Conscient Health blog, um, there was a headline in the US that says, obesity cure found, puppies. And literally the, the story was about the benefits of owning a dog, right? And probably the increased physical activity that's associated with a dog. But there was nothing in there about weight loss or curing obesity. This, this simply was, you took a very, um, probably what was a good scientific study and actually just took a, made a headline out of it that really wasn't based on what it was. As Ted talked about before, it probably was a good study on the benefits of health, not necessarily on helping people who live with obesity. So these are the categories, and Ted mentioned some of these already, but I think the things that I noticed most is the oversimplification of the problem. Just remove this one thing from your diet and obesity will magically disappear. You have to avoid taking that simple bait. And I realize this comes from press releases oftentimes from the uh, people who do those studies. In fact, we do studies as well and we release press releases, but we try very careful to actually paint the full picture and not just pull out one sp specific item. The promises of cures, I will tell you right now that we do not have a cure for obesity. We actually don't have a treatment for obesity that works for everyone who has obesity right now. Um, and so we have to be careful um, when we make those kind of promises. Um, uh, the fact is, is that the vast majority of treatments we have now do not work for the majority of people. And, um, and so we have to make sure we recognize that obesity is this chronic multifactorial disease. You know, we need to be cautious about further stigmatizing around obesity by showing people with obesity in a negative light. Again, cultural says that people with obesity are bad. You know, reality is, is that obesity is bad, but we should have dignity and respect for people who uh, live with obesity. And also, you know, we see a lot of these headlines that talk about dehumanizing people by just, I mean, people think obesity is just a statistic, right? In the US now, we have 40% of adults have obesity and 10% of women have severe obesity, meaning they're 100 pounds or more. But that doesn't tell the real story, that's just a statistic. Those are real people. Um, and I, I think I often see too many of these headlines that, again, are just about the statistics, but actually don't ever include a conversation with someone who is actually living with the condition um, and, and demonstrating it uh, and demonstrating the impact it has on its life. And then I also just uh, would always so push, and as Ted talked already, about this importance of actually reporting on evidence base, right? And actually reading the details and looking at the quality of the studies. Um, don't be in that rush to promote whatever the next big thing that's coming out because the reality is when it has come to obesity, every next big thing hasn't worked, right? The reality is as obesity rates continue to rise around the world, um, even though uh, there are lots of people out there claiming they have the next big thing. So there, there is much work to be done that way. So I, will, I picked on you for a little bit as members of the media, so I also will say that you are an ally as well in certain things. And here are some headlines from some of your colleagues around, around the world um, talking about um, how uh, some of this messaging can actually backfire. And really this idea that blame and shame um, may be part of the problem and not part of the solution. Um, again, I'll say it again, obesity is bad, not the people who live with it. Just like cancer is bad, but we have dignity and respect for people that have cancer. Just some data to show you about um, when we look at the news reporting on obesity, and this is uh, uh, data from uh, Rebecca Poole's group at uh, the Rudd Center. 
Um, this is actually a study that looked at online news articles about obesity and uh, how the people were portrayed uh, in, those, in those articles, whether it was a photo or a uh, video. And you notice some characteristics uh, based on this is that most of the time uh, someone was overweight or they had obesity, um, about 60% of the time they were shown without their head. We actually depersonalize obesity by removing people's heads. And look at the normal weight uh, or uh, non-overweight category. Only 6% of the time did people have their head removed in the photo. So we, we do depersonalize this. And this is actually very noticeable. In fact, the, in the US, we have a satire site called The Onion. And when obesity rates hit 35% in the US, um, uh, they, they, their headline was obesity rates 35%, headlessness 100%, because that's the way people are depicted that way. And then the other thing is looking down at the positive characteristics. We very rarely show people with obesity wearing uh, professional clothing in images. Um, and um, if you look at people who are, who are normal weight or so-called non-overweight in this study, 50% uh, of uh, them were shown wearing professional clothing. So no matter my size, if I was in front of you today, I'd still be in my jacket. But that's not how I would be portrayed uh, in, in any kind of a news article uh, if this was shown in that way. This is actually the same data for videos. And I just, I just included it to just... Uh, show that the same problems happen, though at literally at slightly less rates for headlessness. I guess it's a little harder to shoot uh, someone being headless in a video. I think my, our videographer in the back of the room would actually, uh, he'd get fired if I didn't have my head right now when he was, he was viewing me. But, um, but you see the data there. But you also see, um, maybe because video is often shot more in real life situations, um, you see the higher rate of uh, people with obesity um, being professionally dressed. However, it does not match those of, uh, that are so-called normal weight. Here's the summary of that data. So 72% of images stigmatized people living with obesity. 65% uh, of videos stigmatized adults. Um, and then from our studies, we know that stigmatizing images make people's attitudes worse around this. Uh, Non-stigmatizing images really improve people's attitudes. And guess what? It's probably not surprising right now. And we have this movement in the US around fat shaming, um, that people are backlashing against fat shaming, because the public is tired of it. They really want these non-stigmatizing images and images that represent people in a real way, not a stigmatizing way. So here's my uh, suggestions for rooms for improvement. Appropriate imagery, appropriate language, Work on educating your peers. As I mentioned, I really rarely find trouble with the substance of an article. It's usually the headlines and the images. And we have guidelines to help with that. You know, recognize the difference between reporting on the disease and someone living with the disease. Again, obesity is bad, not the people living with it. And then the, recognize that complexity of obesity. If it was simple, we would already have solved it, right? And, and the, frankly, we're going the wrong direction. So here's a couple of resources on that, on the imagery, OEC, and lots of our partners from around the world, including the Red Center, the Canadian Obesity Network, and the World Obesity Federation, have image galleries that are available to the media to use that have images that are non-stigmatizing. And in fact, some of them even have B-roll you can use for some of your video work. Adopt people first language. Um, so this is replacing the word obese, not using the word obese anymore. So we don't say someone's cancerous. So they have cancer, right? So why do we say people are obese, right? So they have obesity. And, and you can, so you can say an individual with obesity or someone who has obesity. Um, and I will tell you in the US, there's been a big push around this. Um, and in fact, our own Amer American Medical Association has uh, now required the use of people first language in their publications. It is interesting that we actually had to go to them and actually ask them to do this because they actually have a guideline previously that says we have to use people first language for all diseases, um, but they seem to ignore it uh, when it came to obesity. In fact, Ted and I wrote an editorial for their journal uh, and uh, they sent it back edited to uh, use the word obese in it, I think like eight times. And uh, we had to remind them of their own policy that uh, it is uh, that requires people first language, and, and then therefore our partners went through and actually got them to re-emphasize that point. But it it is important, and as Ted has said, and I, I can't say it any better, so I'll just use this quote here: uh, "Obese is an identity. Obesity is a disease. By addressing the disease separately from the person and doing so consistently, we can pursue this disease while fully respecting the people affected." We do have guidelines as well. So these are 
Um, developed in the United States, this is guidelines for media portrayals of individuals affected by obesity. It also includes some information on language use, endorsed by all the major obesity groups in the U.S. and some of our partners from around the world. Uh, these are available to you. The link is there to download, and, and we're happy to share these slides. And, you know, as I end up here, I, I just really want to talk to you about why bias is so important beyond, um, uh, beyond just sensitivity issues. And, and I will tell you that um, in, uh, when Cherie gave Jimena's presentation, she talked about the difference between bias, stigma, and discrimination. And it is my belief that bias and stigma ultimately lead to the worst thing, which is discrimination. And so this is some data from the US. Um, first of all, it is not illegal to discriminate against someone in the US based on their weight, so uh, just so you know. But if you look at this data here, um, and you know, um, the, uh, I guess we'll say those are purplish bars there. Um, if you're a woman, the most likely form of discrimination you're gonna face is the fact that you're a woman. However, in the US, the second most likely reason why you're gonna be discriminated against is because of your weight. Gentlemen, we're not nearly as affected here, and that's something we have to recognize. Actually, something important for all of us to recognize is that bias seems to impact women more than men. However, there's been some new data that just came out in the US that suggests that young men now are being impacted in a much greater rate than, say, for example, older men are uh, with this. So uh, there may be, this may be changing over time, and we may have to recognize that men are more affected. So the reality is, is that stigma and bias lead to this worst thing, which is discrimination um, and outright discrimination, denying people opportunity uh, to be uh, successful in life. And here's that data broken out in a different way, just to show you how uh, discrimination affects people and then especially how early it affects women. If you look here, you know, already when women are just in the overweight category, so usually less than having 30 pounds of extra body weight, 9% um, of them are already facing discrimination. And then look at there when we get to severe obesity. Nearly half of them have faced discrimination. So obviously that affects their life and their quality of life. And the other thing I'll say is it affects people in a much deeper way as well. Um, the reality is, is that when I talk to young people who live with obesity, they will often tell me the greatest consequence of of their obesity is actually the bias and stigma they face. And they internalize that and it makes them have just a very, very poor quality of life. In fact, if, you know, if you're 25 and you carry an extra 100 pounds, the, the, you might not have developed a comorbidity associated with your obesity, but you're definitely facing a stigma and uh, bias from friends, family, uh, coworkers, et cetera. And that really makes people's quality of life uh, suffer over time. And I raise that because, again, I don't think the media is the sole driver of bias. I don't want to suggest that it all exists everywhere, and the media usually represents what the population thinks and moves forward. But I think it can play a role to help reduce that and the impact of, because the impact of bias is uh, so great on, on people living with obesity. So please uh, be an ally in our fight against the disease of obesity by, and by helping those living with it. Um, with some notable exceptions, I will admit that I think the media has been a barrier so far. Um, Fact-based reporting uh, is essential. Dig beyond those headlines. Dig beyond the, um, you know, the one data point. I remember in the back of my mind a story that were always remarkable. In the U.S., we have this television show called The Biggest Loser, um, which um, puts people through what a dozen hours of exercise per day to help them lose weight. And one week, they reported that one of their contestants lost 42 pounds in one week. And the reality is, is that I could uh, take you to the most skilled surgeon in the world, and he can turn your stomach into a size of a golf ball and, and reroute your intestines, and you're not going to lose 42 pounds in a week. So how did that happen? But it, when you report on something like that, and, and ultimately the biggest loser admitted that, by the way, a week's not a week, and it was a much longer period of time. However, it's portrayed to the public as a week, and it was reported as a week. It makes the average person who said, today I'm gonna to start my effort to address my obesity and they lose two pounds, give up because their expectation was to lose so much more. And that is one of our biggest challenges is the expectations people have. And I, I think those expectations are set by the media. So please, please dig beyond those headlines and share the real value in new research products and services. Thank you very much.
thanks very much, Joe. That was quite enlightening. Um, you touched on so many points, and before we open for, for questions from the audience, um, Joe and Ted, I mean, do you think media intentionally stigmatizes people in the media business are people, and they grow up with the same stereotypes and, and misconceptions, or are they actually trying to, to make a profit to attract attention, and, and does it actually work? Does, does, does putting out a headline that sensationalizes obesity actually sell more papers? And if it doesn't, well, then why continue doing it? So, yeah, so I, don't, I actually do not believe, um, for those of you who have seen me talk previously on bias, that most people engage in bias intentionally. I do not think people, and maybe this is me being uh, optimistic, I don't think most people are malicious, right? I don't think they're trying to harm. I think they actually are trying to help um, and just not realizing because they haven't thought about the impact of these and these moving forward. And I'm not 100% convinced it's about selling. It's not done for profit. Maybe it is that, again, maybe me being an optimistic. I, I really do think it is a little bit about the lack of knowledge of um, what impact this is having. And um, and maybe that, as Ted pointed out, that these facts aren't quite 100% uh, supported yet. I think there is this little bit of this lead to you know jump ahead and make sure I can report something new before someone else does. But I'm not I'm not convinced that's for profit. I think that's just more the nature of, of that work. So. I, I think uh, media has uh, two ways that this operates. To a certain extent, media ref holds up a mirror to us yeah. and reflects the biases that are common. But you also see the media play a role of, uh, of reporting facts that uh, inform and educate the, the, the public. And so it's hard for the media to do its job of informing and educating uh, if they have nothing but a mirror to hold up. So I, you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes a missed opportunity, and sometimes it's an opportunity that the media seizes. Uh, I've seen a lot of reporting, and Joe highlighted it, that has uh, really played an important role in informing people. And then I have seen uh, reporting that feeds established biases. Uh, I'm more proud of, uh, of folks who, uh, who, who play that role of informing the public. Thanks, uh, Joe and Ted. Uh, based on, on, on your comments there, I think there's a genuine point in talking to the media in us obesity experts and patient advocates actually putting our voices and, and, and views out there and to work with the media to, to overcome those biases then if it's not just sensationalism. Thank you too and I would like to open uh, to questions of the audience. Anybody? It's the end of the day. I could do it. Come on guys. <laughs> Yes, please. Just speak up a little bit. We have no microphone to go. Oh, that's okay. They can hear me. <laughs> So uh, I'll, I'll give that a try, and, and, and I think Joe can add on to that. Uh, there is a, a huge temptation in public awareness campaigns to catastrophize obesity. Uh, you know, you are going to wreck your health. And I think that the, some of the images that really upset people with that particular campaign uh, the, uh, the one that upset me, I will say, is the depiction of a pack, a cigarette pack filled with French fries. Um, 
you know, and the point it seemed to be making, it, uh, images communicate more than words. The picture is worth a thousand words. I can tell you from having done quantitative testing of advertising, that is a very real thing. You, if you can come up with a, with a really compelling image, it will do more than copy can do by itself. And that image says uh, eating a French fry is the same thing as smoking a pack of cigarettes, uh, which is false. Just flat out false. Uh, and the bias that that feeds is the notion that these folk with obesity have done this to themselves. Now, on top of just the scientific truth of that comes the impact of catastrophizing something, building up the problem without offering a solution. An example of that would be uh, in the United States, we spent a, put a lot of energy uh, several years back into weighing children at school and sending letters home to their parents to tell them that they are fat. Uh, well, guess what? That occurred to the child because when he gets weighed at school, and uh, as one of our directors of the Obesity Action Coalition relates when she was seven years old, uh, a smart aleck boy held up her hand and said, introducing the heavyweight champion of the world. That just sets people up for, for, for bullying uh, while not offering any kind of real help that would do anything about the condition. Uh, so that catastrophizing language is is really important. Now, Joe, I'd, you know, I know you were very involved in that Children's Health Care of Atlanta campaign. Yeah, I think these uh, these type of campaigns, again, um, without offering a solution and just talking about the problem, um, they're just out of context, right? And again, we're just going to add to the stigma of people doing this to themselves. You know, the in uh, uh, there was a campaign in Georgia in the United States that um, was done by the they used a different name, but it was a children's hospital of Atlanta that basically, you know, featured all kinds of images of children who were overweight, but, you know, with statements like, you know, fat kids may not outlive their parents, or, you know, um, he has his father's eyes and, and his diabetes, right, kind of thing. And, and, and again, okay, yeah, yeah, but what's the solution, right? Are, are you really offering something? And if I was a parent of a child, and first of all, if I was a child in, a, in that area, I think I'd probably get made fun of because I looked like one of those kids that was on that bull, billboard. But if I was a parent, what can I really do, right? H how, you know, you're not offering me any solutions. And by the way, your health care coverage in the United States likely doesn't cover any care for your child that lives in that place. So we have to be careful when we do this because, again, we get back to that, that vilifying and, and ca catastrophizing these kind of situations. They're, Honestly, I have not seen a great public health campaign around obesity. I either find them too light or too stigmatizing. We haven't found the middle of the road one yet, and, and we'll find it someday. And I may hopefully OEC will do it, but maybe some of our partners around the world will do it as well. So, Thanks, uh, Ted and Joe. And just a quick word for myself. When, when this campaign came out, I was in London, and uh, I walked into the metro uh, or the tube. And uh, I seen the poster, and my first thought, as as a person with obesity, was, why didn't you talk to us first? Why don't we have a chat? Cancer Society, Obesity Association, we could have done so much better. Thanks for the idea. You're right. There is a aspect of cancer and obesity, but come on, you know, this is an opportunity completely missed. People upset, perceptions skewed. Sadly, uh, an opportunity missed. If there are no further questions, I will close the Media Masterclass 2018. Thanks very much.